thanks to all of the um, uh, I've met today. It's been really fun. And so today I want to talk about computation. And in fact, I gave a different title here because I noticed that there were at least two titles running around about my talks, and now there's three. Um, but uh, I really want to talk about the relationship between individual and collective decision making. And I'm going to talk about some published work, uh, some unpublished work, and also some conceptual work, some ideas that I've been having over the last few years. And so first I'll give you a quick overview of you know, the sorts of questions that we're interested in in my department. So we're interested in principles. So we study a very broad range of organisms with different levels of selection so we can begin to understand why collective behavior was so central to life on our planet. For example, we've studied Placozoa. It's the simplest animal on the planet. It's a collection of several thousand cells. And if you track the nuclei, the density of the nuclei, or if you look at the, the motion of the cells here color-coded in terms of the direction of travel, you see these hallmarks of sort of flocking and schooling, whereby the local interactions among the individuals nonetheless give rise to patterns of activity, of information that can percolate across the length scale of the organism. And what we studied here, in fact, this of course was with Pavel, what we studied here um, is that you know, once this organism reaches a certain size, it can no longer coordinate just by self-organizing mechanisms. And so this gives us an insight into the evolution of nervous systems. One of the cool things about Placozoa, it has the full complement of neurotransmitters, yet it never, ever had neurons. And so we're interested in sort of pre-neural information processing in very simple organisms. As Powell said, I did my PhD largely on ants, and I've always been interested in social insects. But here, there's very close genetic relatedness. And so we can begin to understand mechanisms such as bridge formation or scaffolding that the ants can organize. But elsewhere in the natural world, we get collective behavior among organisms of very low relatedness, particularly many schooling fish. And this also highlights another approach that we use, which is a commonality with what's going on here in Berlin, is that we develop robots. We still cannot solve these equations, even with supercomputers. And so robots provide a very good way to develop and test theories. In this example, we looked at the tail phase relationships between the fish, so we could compare the experiment and theory. People didn't know how or why fish coordinated their behavior in schools. It's been hypothesized for over 100 years that there may be energetic benefits, but they're not in the configurations that one may expect. And so using the robots, we are actually able to find that it's irrespective of spatial position if they match to the vortex phase of their neighbors. And here we can uh, calculate from the real fish how they're interacting with one another. We can compare then how the real fish behave compared to what is predicted from the theory. The theory is dark and the the, the lighter color there are the experimental data. So without the robotics, we wouldn't have been able to develop this theory. So the robots informs biology, but as you'll see, the biology also informs robotics. We've also developed ways of tracking fish, plus uh, including the three-dimensional full body posture of the animal, and also the eye movements. So we can actually reconstruct how they see the world um, and how they respond in this type of environment. So here you can see so it's a little bit dim here, but we're tracking the eyes and we can actually fit a 3D model to the eye. Now, what's tricky here is if we're interested in hydrodynamics, well, if we're blasting these fish with lasers to look at the fluid flow, it's quite challenging. So what we've also developed very recently is a robotic twin of reality. So we can get the full four-dimensional body posture of the fish interacting fish over time, and then we can play back that exact scene in robotics. And we can blast these robots with lasers. We don't need any permits. We can just do whatever we want. We can look in fine detail at the hydrodynamic interactions. Thanks very much. And so this robo-twin environment allows us to replay the real world in a precise uh, robotic platform. And this gives us great advantages. So you can see we can move the robots around in uh, X, Y, and Z. And this then allows us to calculate the thrust, power costs, and do much more effective flow visualization. So what I want to focus on today, however, is what's going on inside the head of this shark and what's going on in this fish school. So two very different types of computation, one may think, initially. What can be the commonalities 
between the neural collective within the head of each individual and the collective dynamics that we see at the level of the school. And due to this intricacy of interactions, as Pavel mentioned earlier on, we were kind of forced to use computer simulations to try to understand collective behavior. We didn't until quite recently have the technology to get inside the head of this individual to see why it behaves in the way that it does. But now with the advent of AI, uh, we can, I've shown you some examples of four-dimensional tracking, but we can also track very large numbers of individuals. The software can learn to identify differences between individuals that no human could learn. Um, also, these softwares tend to be agnostic. These are termites that we've been working on, uh, locusts. It's agnostic to which study organism you employ. And it can identify, for example, these rodents, which to a human observer uh, look identical. Or all, all of these fruit flies, it knows exactly who is whom. And all of the software we develop, we make freely available to the community. And this allows us to look at this hallmark of collective behavior, which is how the change of behavior or physiology, we're also within our cluster looking at spreading of physiological states, spreads within these types of groups. And we can move ahead from the sort of model world by actually considering the sensory information available to the individuals. Earlier, I showed you the hydrodynamic interactions. In actual fact, what we discovered is that the fish are not using their lateral line, their pressure sensing system, to detect socially generated flows. They free up the lateral line to pay attention to flows in the environment, and they use what's called proprioception, or the, the feeling of the, the curvature of the body to respond socially. But these little fish, these are called golden shiners, they don't use their lateral line system. They have a very primitive lateral line system. They're almost exclusively visual. Furthermore, even if we give them very deep water, they will swim at the surface. So it's a quasi 2D environment. And finally, you can get a thousand of these shipped to your house for $70 because they're bred in the billions for, for live bait. And so this has allowed us to reveal, so if you're a neuroscientist, you want to go into the brain to look at how computation occurs. You can look at the physical and functional connectivity and record the activity patterns. Now, if we comparably, you know, compare animal behavior, well, there's no comparison. We just didn't have these technologies. But now we can actually reconstruct the visual fields. We can figure out which visual features they actually pay attention to when changing behavior. So we can reconstruct these networks of communication. Now, this differs from what I've seen today with your robots, where it's just simple physical proximity. Here is actually the visual scene plus decoding the information that they're paying attention to. And these are quantitative predictive networks. So if we zoom in, you can see that they're weighted and directed. I might be strongly influenced by you, but you not by me. So these are very complex time-varying networks. And what we were able to do uh, again, this is collaboration with Pavel, is predict if we cause and we trigger a behavioral change in one individual, we can predict really precisely whether this is going to you know, cross the whole group or just die out. So this, these things are typically very hard to predict, like is a tweet going to go viral or not? And we were also able to sort of turn on, the, on, on its head how people thought about uh, behavioral contagion. But I don't have time to go into that today, but over the years, We've shown that computation, of course, it's occurring within the brain of these individuals. But it's also occurring because they've evolved to change the structure of the network of communication between them, and that can actually also add computational capabilities. We've shown this in terms of, this is a real fish school, by the way, this is not a simulation. In terms of regulating social contagion, modulating response to increased risk, again, with Pavel, where we showed that they're not changing. You know, if you, you imagine if the world gets more risky, you change your response threshold. You might become more sensitive to inputs. And that's true for an individual in isolation. But in actual fact, the optimal strategy within a group can be to do the opposite, to become less sensitive personally, but then change your communication topology to change the signal-to-noise ratio. We've also shown that uh, Groups can sense long-range environmental gradients, even though we could show that no individual within the group could do so. And this might sound a bit group selection-y. You know, I remember I said that these are unrelated individuals. So we've also gone to great care to show that these types of collective computations readily emerge, readily evolve 
among genetically selfish individuals at the level of the individual. Selection is always operating at the level of the individual. Nonetheless, you know, the types of communication we're talking about here are changing the weights of a network, which is much more akin to how we think about how neural networks process information. And so when I wrote this paper long ago about collective minds, I was very cautious to draw these connections. Surely the level of selection is so different, the entities are so different, the complexity of the entities are so different. Surely it's just a metaphorical connection in terms of computation. And what I'll argue for the rest of the talk today is that I think I was wrong. I wasn't bold enough. In actual fact, I think we can go beyond the metaphor and that there are formal mathematical reasons to understand computation within across these different systems. And so the classic view that you know, I contributed to back in the day was that you know, we have relatively simple agents that are interacting with the environment, such as via sort of rule-based social forces like local repulsion, intermediate alignment, long-range attraction. So that's the sort of classic so-called self-propelled particles perspective. And it was useful. You know, we were able to show that these types of models can generate what at least appear to be realistic looking groups. But I was talking to Alex earlier today and he was asking, well, how do you know if it's the right model? And back then we just looked at it and went, well, that looks as if it could be a reasonable uh, model. And so this is a model, for example, as I just explained, with local repulsion, intermediate orientation, and long range alignment. And the field has kind of got stuck, in my opinion, in these types of models that really come from statistical physics. And I want to sort of make a call today that I think these models are wrong, and I think the field needs to, to move forwards. Uh, they do produce pretty pictures, though. So here you can see we've added a predator and a simple rule to move away from the predator. And many of the properties, like the fountain effect, the dumbbell effect, and so on, can be explained just by changing the angle at which the predator attacks the groups. So what's the difference then between this classical view and what I want to propose today? Well, you can frame it in different ways, but ultimately it's that we need to consider the sensory motor interface and also that this is an embodied form of computation. And we've been looking at this in a, a range of different ways and today I'm not going to talk about this particular approach, but this has worked with Carl Friston, some of you may know, where we're looking at surprise minimization. So it's kind of asking the question in the opposite, right? So instead, what we used to do is guess rules. Let's face it, that's what we did. We guessed what they might be doing. And then we looked at what happened when you scaled up those guessed rules. What this does is says, like, OK, let's start the other way. Let's start with the principle. The brain has evolved to look for deviations from expectation um, and their sort of active inference agents. What rules come out from that top level, so high level assumption? And it turns out you can get a heck of a lot you know, what looked like social forces, what looked like the sorts of things we used to have to put into the model naturally come when we turn things around and we think of things in this way. So in this model, the individuals are simply minimizing surprise, moving to minimize surprise. There's two ways to minimize surprise. You can move or you can change your internal model, Bayesian model of the world. So that's one way of looking at these types of problems. But there are other ways to try to connect what's going on within neural collectives and within animal collectives. Now, let me jump back in time to some pretty old work, some work I did with Jens Kreiser, um, where we looked at leadership and collective decision-making. And I'll show you how this actually sets the scene for some of the most recent work that we've been doing in my lab. So at this time, we were interested in how do grouping animals make informed unanimous decisions. In fact, I'd prepared this paper for publication in the journal Animal Behavior, and Jens was the one that said, why don't you try nature? And that, that changed my, my life completely. Um, <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Jens, for many things, but that <laughs> And so we showed that, you know, you don't need to have signaling. You know, individuals don't need to explicitly tell others what's going on. You also don't need to explicitly have things like individual recognition. If individuals have some sort of internal goal-oriented vector, and they reconcile that with social vectors, vectors towards other individuals, that we showed to be sufficient. Now, at the time, we were completely guessing that individuals had some sort of vectorial representation. What I'll show you later is direct evidence 
that this is the case. And we were particularly interested in cases where there's conflict within the group. What if some individuals want to go one way and others want to go another way? Can they come to a consensus? They can't count. They're just using these simple local rules. But nonetheless, we could show following these simple local rules, they could make decisions. Now, one interesting thing we found was that, of course, these animals are moving through space. Almost all animals at some point in their lives make decisions on the move. And it turns out that that spatial component was very important. <coughs> so what I'm showing you here is a group making decisions, a simulated group making decisions, where I'm changing the angle between the two preferences. Five individuals I always fix at zero degrees. Another five individuals in a group of 100, so 90 are uninformed. I can change the angle to which they disagree. If they disagree by a small amount, you can see what they adopt is the average vectorial preference within the group shown by the solid line. So if they could do mathematics and find the average, this is what it would be. And so you can see up to a critical angle, they adopt the average preference. But imagine they're moving towards a red target to their left and a green to their right. Then this angle will slowly change over time as they approach the target. And what the model predicts is we get a sudden transition, so-called bifurcation, where above a critical angle, half of the time this group wins and the whole group goes in this direction, and half of the time this group wins and the whole group goes in the other direction. So it's not the group splitting. This is just the probability of where they will go. So we've gone from averaging very suddenly to a winner-takes-all dynamic. And in a perfectly symmetric world, it's 50-50, which one is the outcome. And so here you can see the green individuals are uninformed. There's an equal number that wants to get to the white and the red targets. And here they're going to choose the red, but equally it could have been the white. Now what if I add one extra individual? So they start at random positions, random orientations. Nobody knows if anyone agrees with them or disagrees with them. But there's now an asymmetry. Instead of five versus five, there's now six versus five. And what you can see is below that critical angle, it's exactly the same as before. They will adopt the average preference. But now once we reach that critical angle, almost always, over 95% of the time, the group will spontaneously choose the majority preferred direction, even though no individual knows what the majority is. They only know their own internal state. And at the time, we didn't really, I mean, we, re we reported this. We thought this was kind of cool. And we sort of wrote in the paper, you know, isn't it amazing that they can do this very sensitive computation despite all of those dumb, uninformed individuals? And this is what I love about science, because it's a journey. You know, that's what we understood at that time. We didn't really understand why we were getting the patterns that we were seeing. And here you can see us breaking the symmetry. Actually, now it's even harder. It's 11 that want to get to white and 10 that want to get to red. But you can see the sort of local noise. These are stochastic simulations, the local noisy nature of the model here. Now, it was only later, when working with Christos Zwanu, a postdoc in the group, that we were getting experimental results that we couldn't understand. <coughs> I was doing evolutionary modeling, not understanding those either, that we realized that in actual fact, they're not able to perform this computation despite the uninformed individuals. It's because of the uninformed individuals. So we often think of uninformedness as being a bad thing. But over a series of papers, we've been able to show that they can actually increase the sensitivity, the accuracy of decisions. Furthermore, adding uninformed individuals, if you have a strongly opinionated minority, they can dominate group decision making. But if we, we predicted if you put five or 10 uninformed individuals into the group, we would return control to the majority. Um, and we tested this and showed that that's the case. You can reverse the dynamics by changing the number of uninformed individuals within the group. And so if you think sort of broadly about what's going on here, we have an informed population that wants to go one way, an informed population that has a different preference, and this uninformed population that are effectively recruitable due to these local interactions, due to the copying behavior within collectives. And so I started thinking to myself, well, working with these fish schools is really hard. I mean, Christos spent about four months getting those three data points. What about what's going on in the brain of the individual themselves? 
Now, I've been thinking about this vectorial integration. Surely the brain must be doing this too. And it turns out that there was some beautiful work, especially over the last decade, such as in Drosophila by Vivek Jarayaman at Genelia, that discovered the ellipsoid body, literally a torus of cells within the navigational center in the central complex in the insect brain. And this activity of the neurons represents both the direction and the magnitude, the strength of preference. What a remarkable thing. Now, in other insects even, it doesn't literally look like a donut, but it functions as an ellipsoid. This has been since discovered also in the mammalian brain. We've known for a long time that the brain has to come to consensus, such as which direction is your head facing. Nacho Monowski has done some really amazing work showing you that there's also vectorial representation towards other individuals within groups. So time and time again, we now know that the brain is encoding information in a vectorial way. And I just want to show you uh, another picture of this ellipsoid body, because what, you know, what a marvel that is. And then only uh, towards the end of last year, finally, the ring attractor was discovered in the vertebrate brain. So these are co evolved completely independently. But if you think about it, all animals have to make decisions on the move. So it shouldn't be surprising that we have a very robust common solution to this type of challenge. So for the rest of the talk today, well, almost all of the rest of the talk today, I'm going to talk about individual decision making. Now, it still relates to collective decision making because my collective now is the collective of neurons inside the brain. And I'm specifically going to talk about the navigational system that animals use and how this can help us explain collective behavior. So don't worry, I'll bring back collective behavior at the end. And I'd just like to um, acknowledge the people who contributed to this large body of work. So Vivek Sridhar was a PhD student with me, and he did the simulations and also the fly experiments. Liang Li did the virtual fish experiments, which I'll show you. Dan Gorbanos, who was a black hole physicist, did all the analytic modeling. Bianca Schell is an undergraduate who did the locust experiments. And this is a long-term collaboration with Nia Gob, a theorist at the Weizmann Institute, and with Martin Nagy in Hungary. And so let's think about what the brain is doing. And then I'll relate this to animal groups in a moment. So what we know in the brain is that there's often reinforcement or excitation among neural groups, for example, that have similar directional preferences. This has been known for a long time. And also, there can be global inhibition and or long-range negative feedback within these systems. And the idea here is we are going to use a very simple model of the brain and understand how the brain comes to a consensus about where to go. So it's a sort of mathematical representation of what's going on in this ring attractor. Now, there's some super exciting work that uh, I'm currently doing with Philip Maney, who was my postdoc advisor at Oxford, and one of his PhD students, Vit, um, where we can actually formally show mathematical equivalence between, we can really honestly go from the, the postsynaptic receptors all the way up to how the brain is operating in terms of collective dynamics of animal groups. So this is really exciting because we can show this actually true mathematical equivalence about computation across these scales. But this is work in, in uh, preparation at the moment. And so if you think about this neural decision making, as I showed you before, in the con uh, I showed you before this image of the animal groups, here we have these sort of informed subsets in this uninformed group. Similarly, within the neural collective, you can think in a similar type of way. And mathematically, we can now show that these models are equivalent. OK, so the, as I said, the focus will now be on individual decision making in both asocial and social contexts. And the collective being modeled is now a neural collective. And I mentioned that you know, all animals have to solve this problem of moving through space and making decisions on the move, whether an insect or a primate. So it's a real challenge. And so we developed this model of the brain. And it's an embodied process. This is going to be really important. I'll come back to it in a moment. But as the animal makes decisions, it moves, which changes the geometry of the representation, which changes the neural dynamics, which changes the consensus, which changes the movement, which changes the geometry, and so on. And what we predict is as the animal moves towards these two targets, 
the brain exhibits a dynamical bifurcation. It's also literally a bifurcation in space, but in dynamical systems theory, this is termed a bifurcation. If we look at the neural dynamics as the animal is moving towards two targets, we can see this bifurcation appearing and the animal chooses one of the two options. So we can now explain this sudden transition from averaging to consensus decision making. And the animal will then go back and forth between these two targets. So what are our theoretical predictions? If we look at the mean field model, so that's effectively a model that we can have a lot of analytic tractability with, we can show that irrespective of the neural noise, unless the brain is incredibly noisy, what we find is that when the animal is far from the two targets, it will be in the averaging phase, but once it approaches the targets, this is this egocentric angle, and it hits the solid line, we can prove that the brain has to transition to a decision. Now, in reality, it seems that all the brains we've looked at around 0.2, and there's this big hysteresis regime here. What this means is that the angle at which the brain bifurcates can be any angle in this point here. But once the brain is switched to a decision, it is very improbable to go back to indecision. Okay, but the data are not gonna be so incredibly clean and tidy because we predict a range of angles um, probabilistically to exhibit this bifurcation. And so again, if we look at a model here, you can see that we should find some evidence of a critical point. Now, why is this important? Well, it's kind of cool to sort of have a new model for how animals move through space, but ultimately it's important because of what we know about universal properties near a critical point. And this is true of any dynamical system, like ecosystem, the financial system, any system undergoing a phase transition will exhibit this remarkable property whereby close to the critical point, as an emergent property, there's an increase in what's called susceptibility. What this means is that the brain becomes incredibly sensitive to any differences in the world, close to and only close to that critical point. We didn't put this in the model. This is an emergent property and a prediction of the model. And what a smart thing for a brain to do, to exploit this emergent property. It's like this little dumb brain can become like a supercomputer close to that point and discriminate things that it couldn't otherwise discriminate. So we can show this theoretically. Yeah, the brain doesn't need to be tuned to criticality. It's, an, it's just a geometrical criticality, so it's inevitability. And you have this emergent ultra-sensitivity. Furthermore, we can show that irrespective of the angle that the animal approaches the targets, there's a manifold at which the critical point will be re reached and the brain will make decisions. Um, is this shown to be robust to noise? Yeah, super robust to noise and, and super robust to system size. It's kind of, if you look at the supplement, we can go down to nine neurons and you still get this sharp bifurcation. Wow. So this very feature of interest, this ultra sensitivity, which is really the exciting thing about this theory, is going to be really hard to prove experimentally or find experimentally. Because anything in my lab, like an air current or a magnetic field that I can't detect, or some light gradient that I can't see will break the symmetry in the brain. And therefore, the animal will not show this perfectly beautiful bifurcation. That's the whole reason it should have the bifurcation, is to break symmetry. So it's going to be really hard to see. So how can we do that? Well, I've just explained why, but how can we do that? Well, we need to make the world super, super symmetrical. So the brain can't break that symmetry in any other way. So how do we do that? Well, we developed holographic virtual reality. So in a virtual environment, we can make things rotationally invariant. We can also play around with physics. So, you know, space need not be Euclidean, time need not be linear, and so forth. But you can see here, this is the illusion. It's an anamorphic illusion. And I can tell you smart humans right now that this tape does not have a volume above the table. But even if I've told you it's an illusion, your brain still sees it volumetrically until the illusion's broken. And even if it goes just roughly back into the right orientation, your brain will pop it back into 3D space. Similarly, this shoe is not actually 3D. So if you track the eyes of an animal and then reconstruct computationally the visual field, you can have the animal moving in and fully interacting with any arbitrary virtual environment. And so I'll give you an example with juvenile zebrafish. 
So these fish are so tiny that their body is covered in a viscous boundary layer, so they can only use vision to coordinate. So we have all of the sensory information that they utilize. This is sped up. And the pillar looks weird to us, but from the perspective of the animal, it looks volumetric, and they'll avoid it even though there's nothing there, it's just light. Similarly, we can create virtual fish. And you can show here that the real fish here is following just a virtual fish that's performing a circular movement. So of course the projection surface is the surface of the bull, but the illusion works so well that the real fish believes this other real fish to be in the tank with it. They never habituate to this. So, and we've also done very careful experiments to show that they believe it to be a real fish, not just a moving object, which they could also respond to. Now, one limitation here is that I can't put two fish into one of my virtual environments. Because remember when that paper was moved slightly, the illusion was suddenly broken? The illusion can only work for one individual. But what we do is we network the systems together so this fish can interact in real time with a hologram of this fish and vice versa. We call this the matrix. So you can see uh, interacting. They're not in the same physical world, but they're in the same virtual world. And again, Liang Li has gone to great pains to show that it's absolutely indistinguishable from putting the fish in the same physical environment. And of course, we can maintain individual identities in the different tanks and so forth, and change the network of connectivity. We can introduce lags, we can do whatever we want. How do you say that the fish uh, don't understand it's a simulation or not? So we can compare, we can put the fish into this virtual world, Right, connect them in the virtual world, and we can also then take them out and put them in the real world. And there are intrinsic differences between fish. They all behave slightly differently to each other. And so we can look at the general properties and also individual differences, and we show it's exactly the same. The data in the virtual reality is cleaner because our tracking system sometimes loses fish when they get closer, but the overall structure and dynamics and every property you can measure is identical. Okay. At least with pairs of fish. Yeah. Is it important that the holographic fish looks like a fish? No. Try with other no. So, kind of disappointingly, um, I was convinced, this is a paper in, in review right now, I was convinced that they must use the body depth, you know, because if you imagine an elongated fish at different angles, it's going to subtend a different angle on your retina. Firstly, the fish always, even though it's a 3D environment, they always choose to swim on a plane. So it's quasi-planar. Um, always. And when they disassociate socially, they disassociate by going up or down. Half a centimetre up or half a centimetre down, they're completely decoupled. So in all of our old experiments, when we just did 2D, we would have missed that. But then we also did what you're suggesting. And I, I was convinced that body depth was going to be the cue they use, but you can make the fish completely flat and they don't care. They, what they really care about is the 3D nature of the environment. There needs to be this closed-loop feedback that they can adjust their depth, and then the, the, the fish doesn't need to have, um, people have argued that the, the motion needs to be biologically realistic. No, not at all. Um, it just needs to be within the range of swim speeds that they exhibit. So it's a very simple algorithm, but it really uses that third dimension to disassociate. And uh, another really cool thing is we can put, like we can have environmental stimuli, non-social stimuli, and we could put them in direct conflict with the social stimuli and show that the brain actually switches. It's a binary switch. They're either socially interacting or not. It's not like they can socially interact a bit and then the environment a bit. So we think the brain is actually switching temporally between these different, uh, to integrate these different cues, social and non-social cues. I'll come back to this later, actually, because the results I'll show you with the locusts are almost identical to the fish. And here are four fish interacting together in the matrix. We're building 15 of these systems now. I never thought I'd work on this little creature, the fruit fly, but it has that wonderful organization and this ability to go into the brain to find out how it makes decisions. And also I'll come back to this, these are locusts. And this one is marching on a motion compensating ball, the biggest ball we could get through the door of the university. And as the animal moves, the ball moves to keep the animal on top. So it can move in a never ending desert environment. So let's test our theory. <laughs> And I, I figured that someone somewhere would have recorded an animal as it moves and as it makes decisions. Not a single paper. People have looked at, say, reaching behavior, you know, how the arm moves through space when making decisions, which, by the way, also shows bifurcation, but they hadn't looked at the animals. And it's almost as if people thought the animal looks at the options, makes a decision, and movement is just the output. But remember, this is an embodied process. 
as the animal moves, it changes the geometry, which changes the neural dynamics, which changes the movement. And it's that embodied process that we've introduced here. And so we predict this bifurcation, and indeed, with experiments with hundreds of flies, and you're just seeing the, the, the average, the spectral plot of the average, you can see clear evidence of a bifurcation, also with the locusts. And remember I showed you <laughs> um, this video from my PhD student, August Poller, what the fly does after it makes a decision? The model predicts it just goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Well, I looked on YouTube and people have studied this. So this video from Bjorn Brems, it's called Buridin's Paradigm. If you've got two targets, the brain just means the animal goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, again, as the model predicted. So that's cool. So the model's making some useful predictions. But many models don't scale very well to three options. Biologists often just look at two, psychologists as well. Alex is one of the few people that has looked at many more options. And so what happens to the model when we give it three options? And I was kind of surprised. I thought the leftmost option would cancel the rightmost option and the group would go down the middle. But it doesn't. What it does is it breaks the world into a series of repeated bifurcations. And at each critical point, probabilistically, it excludes the least favored option. What a brilliant thing for the brain to have evolved to do. So the theory now predicts a double bifurcation for three options. But now we need an order of magnitude more data to test this theory. So this, these are really hard experiments to do. But if we're correct, the brain spontaneously breaks the world down into a series of binary decisions, and close to each bifurcation, it becomes very sensitive to any differences. And indeed, we find evidence in the fly and the locust brain that they're conducting this double bifurcation. We also show that the flocking model and introduce this double bifurcation, but only if we have what we had in our nature paper, which was the forgetting factor, which I've never seen in any other model. So there are many principles of decision making. If it's easy to see differences, you can make accurate decisions. If it's hard, you can integrate over time. Controlling for these, these are facts. Controlling for these, we argue that geometry is a previously unexplored principle. And so we can then do an experiment so what biologists do is they will typically put an animal in between two options and, of course, not record how it moves, just record what the decision was. Or they'll put it on a Y maze or a T maze where they force a bifurcation. That's a better thing to do. And in fact, probably more experiments are done in that way without people realizing why it's a better thing to do. But we can actually put the animal at different positions where we predict here the brain cannot go through the bifurcation, it's beyond the bifurcation point, and here the animal can, and we predict this animal, for exactly the same decision, should be about 35% more accurate. That's a big increase of accuracy. And so working with an undergraduate student in the lab, Lisa, we tested this, and we made it a really challenging problem. The locusts really struggled to choose their preferred option, but if the brain can go through the bifurcation, as we predicted, it amplifies the computational problem. We also developed a mean field model, and I'm not going to go into the details of this, but we can prove these properties. We can also prove that the brain will undergo these transitions. But the reason I did want to mention this is perhaps there are people here who are interested in sort of the more analytic side of this work. And also, so this paper was published just a few weeks ago, um, where we look at the, you know, why are there only two bifurcations? In principle, there could be up to five. But in reality, we only see two, and we prove why that's the case in this model. But the other thing that's important about this paper is we show that the way space is encoded in the brain has to be non-Euclidean. So we just assume that animals are using Euclidean space or Cartesian space. But there's a growing body of work, including our own, that shows that the brain actually doesn't need to have that representation. You can measure this with the neural activity. And we can actually show that the brain has an elliptic representation of space. And we can also show in that paper that this elliptic representation isn't particularly important for two options. It doesn't really matter. But for three options and four options, it matters greatly. It prevents the animals getting trapped in indecision. And it's a trick that the brain can use to make highly effective decisions in incredibly complicated environments. So this non-Euclidean representation allows them to make these decisions for any number of options. And it also produces really kind of pretty pictures, which I, I like. Okay, so if I'm arguing that this is a new principle, I've shown you data from two insects. They're not related to each other, but it's still the insect brain. 
What about the vertebrate brain? So when we published that paper, it wasn't even known if the vertebrate brain had a ring attractor. It is now known in the zebrafish, the very animal we studied. And we look at a different ecological context. So the fish aren't particularly attracted to static objects, but they'll respond very strongly to virtual fish. And if we change the distance between these virtual fish, and I could never train real fish to do this, if we change the distance, we predict the brain should average, 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 and then exhibit the bifurcation. And we could run these experiments in this very controlled way, and so indeed that prediction held true. Similarly, for three uh, targets, we see a double bifurcation. It looks a bit different because we now have a moving frame of reference. And again, we wouldn't know what experiments to do or how to interpret the data without the theory and the experiments feeding back into each other. And we find evidence, as we predicted, of the double bifurcation. We also have another paper where we've done lots and lots of tests to um, test between the model and reality, and it fits extremely well. Now what we're doing, I'm super excited about. We haven't published anything yet, but we recruited Armin Barr from Harvard, who's an expert at whole brain imaging. So now we paralyze the fish with bungarotoxin. We put them in an, uh, at, under a two-photon microscope. We then decode the commands it sends. Luckily, fish just have about 18 neurons in the reticular spinal formation that gives all of their body posture, all of their movements. We can decode that. So when the fish thinks to turn left, it can turn left in virtual reality. But it thinks to accelerate or decelerate, it can do so in VR. Plus, we can get the whole brain at cellular level of resolution. We now have two of these, so we can connect them together to have the fish interacting. So we can go from the cellular collective that gives rise to individual decisions and from individual decisions to collective decisions in the same uh, setup. And what I was planning to talk about uh, today until my son was injured um, was how we can also use the virtual reality to gain control laws for use in robotics. And I'll just quickly summarize it because I know there's a lot of interest in robotics here. But we can show that these models are extremely applicable and do not need to know or have knowledge about the robotic platform. If you look at standard human controllers, like um, the model predictive controller, it has to have omniscience. It takes a day and a half to optimize for your robot using a supercomputer. Well, the evolved algorithm just works out of the box. And it works for aerial vehicles, terrestrial vehicles. This is work done in Constance. And also with MIT, with Daniel Loris, we've looked at watercraft. And so we can show that these evolved algorithms, this is BioPD, perform really close to optimal. And they're much simpler and much, much more robust. So if this is so robust and such a, a guiding principle, then surely we should also find evidence of it in difficult systems, such as what about wild primates? That's about as difficult as it gets. And this is work that was led, with, uh, well, I did with Ari strandberg Peskun when she was a PhD student with me at Princeton, which is now a group leader in Constance. And working with Meg Crowfoot, we put GPS collars and almost all adults in a wild, unhabituated baboon troop. For ethical reasons, we didn't put uh, collars on juveniles, but the juveniles just hang out with the mother. And so now, every second, we have the location of the individuals. And people, yeah, there's a question there. So people uh, argued that you know, there's, a, there's a linear dominance hierarchy. All males are dominant to all females, and the dominant male tells everyone what to do effectively what's in the literature. And we could ask that. We could ask whether individuals have more influence, whether they're males, females, subadults. It made no difference whatsoever. And we can then ask within the brain of each individual, and they're perceiving these sort of leadership behaviors, do we find evidence of the bifurcation? And indeed we did. Both for the case where there's symmetrical options and where there's an asymmetry, where they will tend to choose to follow the majority. So we think this general framework, and we're sort of getting closer and closer to a sort of unifying mathematical framework, really unites computation within the brain of the individual, but also the interconnections between individuals and how this guides collective behavior. OK, now I just want to take a few minutes to talk about some unpublished work where we've applied this to a real collective system that's a huge problem which is locusts, locust plagues. These animals impact the livelihood of one in 10 people on the planet through food shortage. Yet there's a handful of people around the world studying them. 
And it's thought that climate change is going to increase locust problems enormously. And so locusts actually only have wings in the final stage of life when they're adults. The swarms actually form when the animals are wingless juveniles. They'll hatch out. This is some time-lapse footage from the lab in Oxford where I was before Princeton. And they'll start marching together. Really quite remarkable. As far as you can see, billions of insects marching in unison. And I did my field research at the time in Mauritania, but this one species, the desert locust, can invade up to one eighth of the land surface during plague years. So it's a really big problem. However, it's affecting poor people, so there's almost no research funds to look into this. The FAO estimates, as I mentioned, that the impact livelihood of one in 10 people on the planet through the impact on food security. And it was admitted in science that even after 50 years, fighting locusts is more of an art than a science. So can we take our knowledge of collective behavior and apply it to a real world problem? What is the mechanism underlying collective motion? Now, Pavel and I also worked on this problem back in the day with our statistical physics models. And again, I think that was the right approach at the time but I'll show you today that they're, they're not, it's not the right approach. So what's the prevailing view? Well, it comes from this paper that I worked on with Steve Simpson. This is a group when we were in Oxford together, David Sumpter, uh, Camille Buell. Um, and you know, it's, it's received a lot of attention, this work. And we argued, we were thinking, we were so enamored with statistical physics that we argued that you could consider the locusts as a statistical mechanical type system. And this is the same principle that I see in 99% of work in collective behavior, the same type of thinking. And so we built a sort of particle accelerator for locusts in Oxford, where the animals, you know, they're not super smart, they'll march around, uh, you know, until they die of exhaustion in this environment. And at the time, this was the state of the art tracking that I developed. Um, you know, it's now primitive, but at the time, this was very sophisticated. And when we did the experiments, we ran them for eight hours, which is a typical marching day in the life of a locust. And if you take all of those trajectory data and turn it into alignment, which is basically the locusts marching clockwise is one, counterclockwise, if it were minus one, they're all marching counterclockwise. And you can see that over eight hours for low density, it's a mess. It's a bit like particles of a gas bumping into each other, but no collective order. But as we increase the density of the insects, we go into an intermittent regime where they show a line, high alignment in one direction, then they switch. And in high densities, they would choose either clockwise or counterclockwise collectively and march for the whole eight hours in that common direction. And so we thought to ourselves, well, this is reminiscent in statistical mechanics of systems like magnetic spins. A magnet has magnetism because it's an emergent property of the alignment of the particles. But if you heat a magnet up to the Curie point of 770 degrees, the noise now propagates across the whole system, and your magnet loses its magnetism. So we thought, well, that's really cool. Can we think of a model locust as mobile magnetic particles? And this is called the V-Shek model, for those who know the, the literature. So we just assumed that the locusts align, so they somehow have knowledge of the orientation of others or the, the directions of movement of others, and they simply align with them like magnetic spins align. And we argued that, well, this looks like reality. We could produce pictures that look like reality. We could produce data that look like reality. So here's the, the real system. And when we compared, at least visually, everything looks great. The theory seems to match the experimental data. And it's only about six months ago, or maybe a little bit longer, that I went back to the data and I thought, there's something suspicious here, something not quite right. So if we look at the V-Shek model, and we have this density-dependent transition from disorder to order, and we look at the data, where well, this is eight hours of the marching life of the locusts, there are data points that cannot be predicted by the model, where the system at very low densities maintains very high order for a very long time. That's just statistically impossible, or so improbable that we should never have seen it. And there are many points that don't fit the model. And again, you know, our paper then 
resulted in a whole bunch of other papers that did exactly the same as us. They changed density and they showed patterns like this where as you increase density, you go from disorder to order. And it matches this theory from physics. So what is this theory? It's basically the central limit theorem. It's basically if you've got noisy, so the idea is that each individual is a noisy integrator. And if you pool this information, if you have many of them, then statistically, you're decreasing the variance. That's all it is. Nothing very clever about it. And there's a problem. Since density and order are positively correlated, how do we know what's causing what? What do I mean by that? Does the alignment result from the averaging out of uncorrelated errors, as, as models suggest, all classical theory of collective behavior suggests? It's possible. Or whether it's the alignment itself that triggers the behavior independent of density. And because the two are correlated in reality and have never been uncorrelated, we simply have no idea which is which. So is it the amount of information or the quality of information? How can we decouple these? Furthermore, we can ask other mechanistic questions. In the cousin model, the V-set model, they all assume explicit alignment with other individuals. Well, let's ask, is there explicit alignment in the real system? So, what do people think is going on? Well, a group initial, Amir Ayali's group, uh, they did experiments where they had moving dots, coherent moving dots. But in these experiments, the locust is forced to be aligned with those dots. It cannot rotate. And so you're just changing the probability of the animal moving or not moving. Not quite the same thing. If you look at the literature on schooling fish, by the way, the same mechanism, I don't have time to talk about it today, but the same mechanism also explains schooling fish. It's assumed that it must be the optimotor response. So what is the optimotor response? Well, the reason it's such a compelling idea is that it's innate and it's extremely robust. If you put moving stripes or moving dots to an insect or a fish, it will tend to follow them. So if it's innate and it's really robust, and in the swarm there's going to be optic flow, obviously this must be the mechanism. And people haven't actually asked whether it is or isn't. And you can see there clearly is lots of optic flow within these groups. And so we've also developed the technology now to go to Africa and track the animals in the wild. So what I'll show you now is data from the field, uh, data from large-scale experiments, and data from virtual reality. Okay, so when we worked in the wild, we take a locust out of the swarm and we put it back. What do they do? They march with the swarm. But now we can knock out the olfaction. Doesn't matter at all. Even in the swarm, you can actually put strong odors that they normally respond to. They've switched the olfactory system off. It's really cool. Polarized vision? Nope. Now, Pavel and I, we'd worked on some papers where we thought the contact process itself or the repulsion could be enough for some nomadic ordering. But that's not the case. If we take out vision, they still march, but they march in exactly random directions. So the contact process of others bumping into them doesn't align them. So this is terrific. Vision is necessary and sufficient, and that's the one thing that we can do in virtual reality. Now, another cool thing to know about locusts is locusts can't stand being near each other. They're actually shy, cryptic green grasshoppers. It's only when they're forced to come together that they change, and Steve Simpson has discovered this mechanism. So this is great. So we have the same animal, literally the same genome, literally the same animal, can be social or asocial. So we can compare it to itself in terms of these types of dynamics. So if the optic flow stimulus was the mechanism guiding locusts when they're in a swarm, then we would predict that if we show the classic optical flow stimulus, that the gregarious should be more responsive to the solitarius. And so we did this experiment. And if anything, the solitarius was slightly more sensitive. So again, this is an argument against optic flow being the, the mechanism here, perhaps. Okay. We can also put solitarious and gregarious individuals into virtual swarms, these volumetric virtual swarms. And the solitarious do not march, don't move in the same direction as the swarm, whereas gregarious do. So clearly, 
it's not just about optic flow, because the optic flow here is the same for both conditions. And remember, the solitarious individuals responded very strongly to the classic optic flow paradigm. So the brain is doing something more. It's computing something different than optic flow. We can do this bifurcation experiment. If you think about this bifurcation experiment, we could just repeat this with the, the locusts. And the prediction, if they were using optic flow, is that this distance shouldn't matter. What we're showing here, the bifurcation, are the real data. So that their brain also go, undergoes this bifurcation. And I, I like this experiment a lot because we designed an experiment that's got literally orthogonal predictions for the classic model, the cousin model, the V-set model, the optic flow model, all predict this alignment behavior. But the new model, the ring attractor model, predicts something different. So if you have just marching insects on each side of the animal, as far as you can see, and you put a gregarious individual in there within the virtual swarm, the classic theory, all of the classic models, will predict the animal moves in this direction. But the cool thing about the vectorial hypothesis is it's orthogonal. And so this is the prediction of the model, the, the target-based vectorial uh, ring attractor model, and these are the data. You almost don't need to do the statistics, but of course, we did the statistics to show that the ring attractor model much better fits the data. And this is true also, by the way, of schooling fish. And we can then ask, well, now we can decouple order from density. Was that science paper correct, that there's this density-dependent transition as statistical physics predicts? Well, no. Density has no effect whatsoever. It's really about the quality of the information, nothing about the density of the information. Density has no statistical value whatsoever. So that paper was, at best, misleading. But of course, we didn't deliberately do that. This is how science works. That's how we thought about things at the time. And my sort of words of caution, uh, I really think that you know, this preponderance of the cousin model, the V-set model, and so on, great, it started the field, but let's move on, because we now have the tools to actually go inside the brain of these individuals. And Pavel is also pushing this, that you can actually go beyond these explicit alignment models to understand behavior. And if you're interested, we also worked with Tom Scott, and got almost three million views just showing our ongoing experiments where we're recording from the brain of the animals as they're in these swarming environments. And um, I just want to advertise now Constance. We're very close to you guys. Um, we also have an excellence cluster that overlaps in very interesting ways with your cluster here, uh, the Center for the Advanced Study of Collective Behavior, which is a, an inter interdisciplinary community. And we're sort of you know, really living this out as you are here. I see you're all together in the same uh, building. Similarly, we also got research funds to build the world's first building for collective behavior in Constance. It's also got some pretty terrific views. So please do consider coming to visit us. And it's not just a nice building. What's underground is really interesting too. Here we have a 15 by 15 by eight meter imaging hangar that we use for our robotic experiments, um, human experiments, animal experiments, including, oops, including uh, a recent experiment where we had 10,000 locusts. Uh, and we're the first people ever to be able to get a marching band actually forming within lab conditions. Um, so it's, and, and we can also track the individuals. This is sped up a bit too fast. Um, and we can do all sorts of other experiments that like we made predictions about coupled oscillations between the targets. So this is like Buridan's paradigm that I showed before, but now at the collective level, you can see the locusts are synchronizing there. We also look at synchrony in other creatures like these humans. Where again, we can apply these kind of technologies looking at eating behavior. We've developed, um, so I was always, uh, always had a passion for starlings. And when I was in Oxford, Alex was working on starlings. And finally, years later, I managed to work on starlings too. And we developed a system that could track multiple starlings, plus record the, the acoustics remotely. So we can record who's communicating with whom. And in these particular experiments, we're interested in who can see whom during foraging tasks of the type that were directly inspired from Alex. Um, we've also uh, worked with from 2D to 3D, so we can use these uh, to train neural networks. Um, we're pushing forwards now 3D tracking in the wild, looking at social learning, for example. Um, oh, I don't know why that didn't play. It doesn't really matter. Oh, here we go. Here's some pigeons, but we can also do this with great tits and other animals looking at social learning. And finally, I just want to come back to the sharks that I showed you at the beginning. 
because this is our tough field research in the Maldives. <laughs> very, very stressful. Um, this is literally what we're studying. This is a photo from postdoc Angela Albi. Uh, and now the technology, the deep learning technology, is so sophisticated that we can actually get the types of data that were only ever dreamt about before, or from lab conditions. And of course, the real world doesn't behave anything like the laboratory. And so we're really excited about applying these technologies. Um, here you can see the sharks in slow motion and the waves propagating across these wild fish schools. And I just got this video today. Unfortunately, it's a bit overcast, but the deep learning, this is a real fish school in the wild. We can now even get the uh, positions and orientations of individuals. And the sharks are also collective, which is wonderful. Here you can see about 30 sharks interacting with each other. Inside each of these vacuoles is a black tip reef shark. And we can also show that they are collective in terms of their timing and hunting strategies. And this is a lovely comparison because Jens Kraus and Pavel have been studying sailfish. And so there's some, compar uh, some comparisons that we can make. Ours is thankfully a very different system. So hopefully we'll have some new exciting results plus this very pretty picture. Um, and lastly, in the last slide, um, I also, I'm, I would, I'm really besotted by wolves, and so when I'm studying wolves, the software can recognize the identities of the individuals. This is an endangered ancient lineage of wolf in India. We're tracking them day and night. They're completely habituated to the drones. Humans can't get anywhere near them, but we can basically get them 28 to 29 days out of the month. Plus, we can identify each individual. We can do body posture reconstruction, so we get lots of interesting data. And, you know, no one wants to work on this, but I've got a postdoc available for working on these types of systems if people are interested. Thanks very much.